now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Fibber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. Now on Classic Radio Theater, we're going to go back to April 6, 1944, in the middle of World War II, an episode of Radio's Outstanding Theater of Thrills, Suspense. This episode stars screen star Katina Pachino in an episode entitled The Wom- A Woman in Red. Not The Woman in Red, that's something different. This is A Woman in Red. Roma Wines presents Suspense. Roma Wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Salud, your health, senor. Roma Wines toast the world. The wine for your table is Roma Wine, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is the man in black, here for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California to introduce this weekly half hour of Suspense. Tonight from Hollywood, Roma Wines bring you the remarkable actress whose performance in the Paramount picture For Whom the Bell Tolls won her an Academy Award, Katina Paxinu. And so with The Woman in Red and with the performance of Madame Paxinu, we again hope to keep you in Suspense. all of London, few houses were so fine, so correct, so austere, and yet gracious with age as number 30 Henrik Square. That was true of its reception room, true of its long, quiet hallway along which the young man led the girl. Aunt Rita, this is Miss Julia Ross. The woman rested her knitting in her lap and slowly turned around. She was a giant of a woman, a woman of 60 in a bright red dress. For several seconds, she stared fixedly across at Julia. Then, in an instant, a soft, gentle smile came on her face. Perfect. How perfect. I beg your pardon? Here. Come over here, child. Let me look at you. That's it. Over there, child. Sit there on the divan. And, and Carl, I think I shall have my milk now. And Miss Ross will have some with me. Will you, won't you, Miss Ross? Oh, some milk? Oh, but I, I never... Some warm milk and a biscuit, of course you will. I always find it very sustaining. Uh, Carl, you heard the young lady. <laughs> and stop staring at her. You've seen a pretty girl before. Was I staring? <laughs> Excuse me, Miss Ross. Harry now like a nice boy. Is he your secretary? Let us say that he has been substituting... Until I find someone like you. You mean, you think I will do? <laughs> Don't you? <laughs> well, I... All I know is when I saw your advertisement in the paper, Miss Crable, I, I couldn't believe my eyes. Wanted secretary, Irish girl, blonde hair, age about 25. It was all so perfect. It sounded just... Well, it was like me. And just like Sheila. That was my former secretary, Miss Ross. You, who passed away just recently. Oh, She had been with me many years. I'm so sorry, Miss Crable. I had the feeling that my loss might be lessened if I could really replace her. (laughs) An old lady's whim, of course, uh, because no one is ever exactly like someone else. You, for example, I'm sure you have friends, acquaintances, relatives, perhaps, uh, you see now and then. Uh, Sheila didn't, but... but, But you see, I don't. What I mean is, my parents aren't living, and so far as friends or acquaintances are concerned, I... I hadn't had much time lately, and... Well, my landlady, of course, I know her, but... Unbelievable, Miss Ross, because it's so perfect. You see, the less time you have for outside attractions, the more time you have for me. The milk and Rita and the biscuits. Uh, Will this table do here? That will be fine, dear. And leave us alone. Oh, very well. My aunt is a very domineering woman, Miss Ross. (laughs) But also a generous one, I think. (laughs) Your milk, dear. And a biscuit? Oh, just the milk, thank you. Miss Crabo, there's something you must know. Uh, well, don't hesitate, child. Miss Crabo, I, I'm afraid I'm not quite what you think. I mean, I've never really done any secretarial work before. Oh. <laughs> I've had some 
business training, a little, but not oh. actual experience. <laughs> I I mean it, Miss Clay. I, I lied in what I wrote you. I, I wanted the position and I needed it so much. You and... silly girl. <laughs> you mean you still want me? Certainly. Now finish your milk before it, it gets cold. Oh. <laughs> As a matter of fact, there will be very little secretarial work for you to do. I shall want uh, a sort of... Uh, Yes, a companion. Now, I shall want you to start immediately. You will, of course, live here in the house and... Live in the house? But of course, you are my companion. Oh, but I didn't understand that I... Yes. Well, then, I think perhaps I should make plans accordingly. I mean, I'd better leave now. I oh. I shall want to go to my boarding house and cancel my lodging. Oh, there will be plenty of time for that child. Carl and I generally take an afternoon stroll and would like you to... But, but you see, there'll be other arrangements. People I must see and people? things to... People? But you said you knew no people. Oh, yes. Well, um, Miss Crabo, I have no qualifications for this position. I... Oh. Why, uh... child? What's the matter? I don't know. Suddenly, I, I feel so drowsy. Well, then, I would just lie back on the diamond. Oh, but there's no reason for it. I... Oh, but there is, child. You are weary from the strain, the uncertainty, the ceaseless search for work in a strange and friendless city. The milk. Oh. There was something and in it. so you relax oh. your nerves. They go to sleep. Yes. Sleep. Carl. Oh, Carl. Yes, Aunt Rita. Have you finished the note, oh, dear? Yes, only this moment. I... Well, don't just stand there. Let me see. Aunt Rita, please. She is so harmless. She... <laughs> and so perfect. And now read me the note. Oh. Uh, to Department KL, Southern hmm. Development. Leaving at once for Dublin, Ireland. We'll communicate in ten days. Ten days, Carl? We won't need so much time. Make that five. Just as you say, Aunt Rita. Then sign it Sheila Campbell and post it to British Intelligence. Night for Suspense, Roma Wines bring you as star Madame Katina Paxinou, whom you have heard in the prologue to The Woman in Red by Anthony Gilbert. Tonight's adventure in Suspense. April 6, 1944, Suspense on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. No offense, but are you a little fat when you look in the mirror? How would you like to learn the secrets to lose three to five pounds a week easily? without joining the gym or going through any crazy diets. It's called Body Sculpt by Med Diet. For the last two decades, we've been helping people just like you that have pounds they want to shed. We've helped millions of people lose thousands and thousands of pounds over the years. And now it's your turn. Learn the secrets of how to lose weight with one simple phone call. You'll see an amazing difference in a matter of days. Don't believe us. We'll offer you a money-back guarantee. If you're ready to start losing weight right now, call right now to learn more about your risk-free order to Body Sculpt. Call for your risk-free offer. 800-738-5332. 800-738-5332. 800-738-5332. That's 800-738-5332. Okay, okay, Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. I know I screwed up. I know it was the lady in red that was the song in the 80s and the movie in the 80s. And this is the wom- a woman in red. And this is from an episode of Suspense, April 6th, 1944. And now it is with pleasure that we bring back to our soundstage our star, Katina Paxinou, in The Woman in Red. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Feeling better, Julia? After your little nap? No. No, I don't feel better. Well, the walk and a little something to eat will do wonders for you. There is a little tea shop up here. I don't want anything to eat. And please don't hold onto my arm. Oh, now, child, is that a way to talk? You seem a bit shaky, that's all. Here we are. Carl, you wait with Julia. 
I'll just look in first to see that it's no to come. And now you have to hold my arm. No, wait, Miss Ross. I don't have to hold. No, don't, don't. Let me go. What are you doing, Miss Ross? Why do you run like that? Please, don't you understand? If I'm to move in with Miss Crabwe, I've, I've got to get in touch with my landlady. But there'll be plenty of time. Plenty of time. What do you want with me? Why are you both... Oh, oh Yes, Aunt Rita? Come along, you two. No. Oh, please, you're making yourself worried about nothing. My aunt, it is just that she's a peculiar... Hurry, lady. hurry, children. Uh, then remember that I am here. I have already ordered for us. Oh, fine, Aunt Rita. Uh, our table, this is it? Yes, sir, here in the corner. Uh. Miss Craigle. Thank you, Mr. James. And Sheila will sit huh? here to my left. Of course. Miss Sheila. Miss Sheila? What? This is your place here, Miss Sheila. Sheila? Why are you calling me Sheila? <laughs> what is it? Why are they laughing? Pay no attention, dear. Just sit down, please. This woman called me Sheila. You both did. My name is... I know. I know, dear. It is Julia. <laughs> Everything is all right. Sh shall I serve the tea now? If you will, please. Uh, now, Sheila, sit down, dear, like a nice girl. No. What, dear? I'm... I'm going to the restaurant. Sheila! It's all right, Miss Crabo. Don't bother. There's no other exit from that room. Oh, I'm so sorry to impose on you, Mrs. James. I had no idea she would be so difficult. Oh, don't give it a thought. Once you explained uh, the situation, we were only too glad to help. Of course, sir, uh, I'd never seen your secretary. I had no idea that... Uh... It's only a recent development. Uh, yes. Shall I pour the young lady's tea now? No, thank you. I can manage. Yes. You know, I was just saying to Mrs. Blandin the other day, I says, I wonder if Miss Crabo and her nephew are still in the neighborhood, I says. Why, they haven't been in my shop for ages, I says. And she says, no, Ah, they... yes. You see, Mrs. James, uh, we don't dare leave her for long, uh, for her own protection, that is. Huh? Protection? Uh, yes, we are a little worried about suicide. Oh, oh, yes. Aunt Rita, Sheila's coming. Uh, well, just call me in case I can help. Thank you. Oh, here you are, dear. Carl, help Sheila into her chair. Oh, yes. Sheila. Thank you, Carl. Relax now, dear, and drink your tea. It's all ready for you. My tea in this cup? No, I won't drink it. You won't drink it? Sheila, what? You're pouring, pouring it into your saucer. <laughs> dear, everybody's staring at you, laughing at you. There's nothing for them to laugh at. I simply prefer to pour my own cup of tea. And that's exactly what I shall do. But... But I... Dear, you don't think I... Do you really believe that I, I... I put something in that first cup of tea? Yes. Yes, I do. You did it before and there's no reason to think you wouldn't do it again. Sheila! Very well, then. Drink your tea. Only hurry. I don't think I can endure much more. Never mind. I shall hurry. I'm just as eager to leave as you. And I'm going straight to the police. Oh, now you're not starting that again. Are you insane? Do you think I'm helpless that I can't get away from you? That I shall simply stand here and... Oh, it, it's happening. What, dear? What's oh, happening? You, you had it in the teapot. Oh, you're tired again, aren't you, child? Is there something oh. I can do, Miss Crabble? These attacks, Mrs. James, they, they leave her quite exhausted. Oh. If, you, if, you, if you'd be good enough to open the door. Of course, Miss Crabble, of course. No. Uh, no. She, she must be taken straight to her room, Carl. Yes. Uh, please, if you just give her a hand. Yes. That's it. That's fine. You are really such a help to me, Carl. Here we are, Sheila. Right here. Now, just go to bed, dear. Let me alone. Come along then, Carl. Uh, she lays quite tired. Yes, Aunt Rita, I shall. You, you said you'd always be here. You've got to help me. What can I do? Here. I've had it in my pocket. A note. Are you coming, dear? Uh, right away, Aunt Rita. It's to my landlady. I wrote it in the restroom at the tea shop. Here, mail it to her. It's my only chance. But I, I can't keep this. Oh, Carl! Uh, she's coming. Yes, Aunt Rita. You can do it. You've got to do it. Good night, Sheila. How very slow you are, Carl. Oh, was I so very long? <laughs> uh, you like her, I can see that. A letter, I imagine. She gave you a letter to post. A letter? Oh, no, I, I was just locking the door. Ah, yes, of course. <laughs> Perhaps I have letters on my mind, dear. 
after that episode with Sheila. <laughs> the first Sheila Campbell, that is. Uh, dear, hand me my knitting. Please. That's a nice boy. Do you know, I'm continually amazed at the stupidity of these English. Can you imagine that girl, that's that supposedly trained agent, dropping that note? <laughs> and addressed, mind you, to the British intelligence. It was very alert of you, Carl, finding it. <laughs> Thank you. Enough. You excuse me, I'm rather tired. But... Uh, yes, uh, this espionage, it's not a restful service. Sometimes I wonder if Burling really appreciates the risk we have taken. Yes, the girl had to be disposed of. There was no doubt of it. That was her report on us. All the facts... Aunt Rita, we've gone over this a thousand times. I really, I'm tired. Mm. Yes. You were right in realizing what, bad to be, uh, what had to be done. It was just that you acted too... Please, Aunt Rita, uh, I explained all that. too hastily, all that. too thoughtfully, too violent. I couldn't help it, I tell you. She rushed into the telephone room out there. I ran after her and that, that stupid catch lock pinned us in. She went to pieces, pounding on the door, screaming, tearing at me. I didn't know what I was doing. There was that bookend, the big one. I lost my head, that's all. It's all your fault. Why didn't you unlock the door? I Where were you? It. Oh, <laughs> I simply want you to remember that every incident counts. Because of you, we cannot produce Sheila Campbell's remains. And we certainly can't allow the police to tear up the cellar to find them. Because of you, we shall have to produce a substitute body. A substitute Sheila Campbell, who will satisfy the authorities completely. We have her, and I don't, it, I don't intend to lose her. The note, please. The note? The one that girl just gave you to mail. I don't know what you're talking about. All I know is you don't have to use this girl. You could get somebody else, somebody just as good. She's not right for it. She... Not right for it. A girl who denies her identity, who shrieks of drug drinks, persecution. She is ideal. The police will accept her as a suicide without giving it a second thought. Yes, yes, if they knew she was really insane, but she isn't. Don't you see? She isn't. She isn't. <laughs> just ask those people at this tea shop and that foolish Mrs. James. She will tell you. <laughs> she will tell the whole neighborhood. Oh, Mrs. James, a few neighborhood gossips. They aren't enough. You have to have someone professional and authority. Listen to me. Our note to British intelligence will divert them for just five days. Within that time, Julia Ross must commit suicide. And we will see that she does. No. No, I won't. I won't go through with it, I tell you. I see. <laughs> What a pity it would be if the police learned who was the last person seen with the first Sheila Campbell. You, you wouldn't. You wouldn't turn me over. This espionage call, it's a very demanding trade. A note, please. Huh. Thank you. Thank you, dear. I knew it was an oversight. <laughs> Yes, sir. Uh, could you tell me if Miss Crable lives here? Miss Cr Why, yes, this is her home, but uh, uh, she's rather busy upstairs, however. Oh, yes, Andrita? Was that someone at the door? I thought... I... Oh. How do you do, Miss Crable? My name is Turner, Dr. Turner. Dr. Turner? Yes, I happened to drop into the tea shop yesterday, uh, Mrs. James' shop, you know, and she told me about your situation. Yes? Well, I thought I might be of some service. My field, you see, is psychiatry. Yes. Yes, I see. Oh, how very thoughtful, Doctor. Uh, please, uh, won't you come right up? Well, thank you. Uh, Miss Campbell's room is up in this floor, Doctor. I thought you might as well see her at once. I know how busy you must be. Yes. Well, the case has been uh, quite difficult, Miss Crable. In many ways, yes, Dr. Turner. Naturally, I feel that uh, someday, with professional guidance and with those things, I can give her patience, understanding. Mm -hmm. I can bring her out of the darkness. Until then, here we are. Sheila. Sheila, dear. That is Dr. Turner. Step right in, Doctor. He's coming to visit you, dear. How are you, Sheila? How do you feel? Uh, doctor, I... I rather think my presence will interfere. Mr. James has undoubtedly explained. Uh, if you don't mind... Yes, yes. That might be best. Won't you talk to me? It's all right, Sheila. Believe me. I'm a doctor. You're no doctor. 
No, no, Sheila. Don't call me Sheila. You're here to help her. Help her keep me prisoner here in this house. Uh -uh, Ah, stop it. Help her drive me out of my mind. Help her. Yes, help her to murder me. Sheila, pull yourself together. She's told you everything. How do I act like this? Told you how to act. You must act. Why don't you leave me alone? Why don't you go away? Oh, excuse me, Dr. Turner, uh, but I became a little bit uneasy. Yes, yes, I can understand. Well, Doctor? Uh, Yes, it's persecution mania, clearly enough. She has all the symptoms, the deep melancholia, the stubborn hysterical insistence that she's about to be done away with. Yes? I happen to be attached to the King James General Asylum, and I'm somewhat familiar with this type of case. There is one important thing, Miss Crabo. Over here, please. Yes, Doctor? The uh, matter of Miss Campbell's protection. Her protection? Yes, from herself. You undoubtedly are not aware of it, but uh, her type is often inclined toward uh, suicide. (gasps) How dreadful. In case those tendencies uh, should become apparent, naturally you'd let me know. Naturally, Doctor. She would then require professional care. Meanwhile, I'm sure your own treatment will be as effective as any. Patience and understanding. Torture me like this, will they? Murder me here in this house. Sheila! No, I won't let them. I'll kill myself first. And the conclusion of Suspense, A Woman in Red, starring Katina Paxino, from April 6, 1944, follows these important words when Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox continues. Let's see, if something costs less, but people are happier with it, That sounds like something to look into, and that's MediShare. Maybe you've heard switching to MediShare to pay for health care can save the typical family 500 bucks a month, and that's huge. But it's also true that people are way more satisfied after making the switch, too. The customer satisfaction rate for MediShare is double that of the typical health insurance plan. Double. MediShare works. It's been around for more than a quarter century, and members have shared more than $3 billion of each other's bills. People love having telehealth and a huge nationwide PPO network. So, yeah, you can save a ton and like it better. Imagine being happy with how you're taking care of your health care. So if you're self-employed or part of the gig economy or you just want to plan you're happy with, you can call right now and get a price within two minutes. A very, very smart use of two minutes. Here's the number you need. 833-34-BIBLE. That's 833-34-BIBLE. 833-34-BIBLE. Are you in bad pain? You know what I mean. Your knees hurt. Your shoulder hurts. Your elbow and back are constantly killing you. And I'm sure you've tried every pain pill or cream available at the drugstore. Am I right? Well, here's something you haven't tried. Pain Magic. Pain Magic is not available at any drugstore. The only place you can get it is by calling the special toll-free number I'm about to give you. And to make things even better, call right now and find out about our buy one, get one free offer. We're so confident it'll work for you that we offer a free bottle with your purchase. No prescription required. Call now to learn how you can get pain magic and get rid of your pain. Remember, your results may vary. 800-492-8164. 800-492-8164. 800-492-8164. That's 800-492-8164. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, the conclusion of A Woman in Red, an episode of Suspense from April 6th, 1944. Miss Campbell. I'll kill myself. That's what I'll do. The window. Stop her. Carl, oh, Carl. Yes, the window. That's it, the window. I'll jump through the window. Young woman, control yourself. Let me go. Don't let me go. Come on, come on. What's going on here? What? What happened? To this girl, she just tried to kill herself. I'm afraid this changes things, Miss Crable. She must be put away. Put her away? Yes, as soon as possible. I'll have the men come at once. You mean take her away from me? But you can't. I've looked after her myself. Uh, why can't I go on doing that? Because it's beyond you now, Miss Crable. No, no. No, you... I'm sorry, but there's nothing else I can do. Would you be good enough to direct me to your telephone? Telephone? Yes, I wish to order a car. Some uh, men from the asylum. Of course. There is a small telephone room right uh, right on down the hall. Uh, this way, please. I know how you must feel, Miss Crable. But you uh, see, it's the... The telephone, thing. Dr. Turner, is in this room right here. J. 
Just sit down there at the desk. Well, thank you. You're sure the young man can handle the girl? I mean... I will go back myself and take charge. Well, that will be safer, I'm sure. Excuse me. Hello? Turner speaking. Yes, Dr. Turner. I'd like you to send a car right away. And three men. The address? It's number 30... Uh, just a moment. Uh, Miss Crable. Miss Crable! Yes, Dr. Turner? I can't open the door. It's locked. Oh, sorry, Doctor. I'll have to get the keys from Carl. Keys? To unlock this door? This very special look locks, Dr. Turner. You don't need any keys. Just open the door from your side. Miss Crable, Miss Crable, where are you? Miss Crable! Aunt Rita, she won't stop crying. I just can't get her to stop. I will get her to stop. A clever one, aren't you, child? <laughs> Pretending to commit suicide so the doctor would take you away. The doctor, where is he? A splendid idea you had, <laughs> leaping out that window. We'll see if we can help you this time. No, don't come near me. Carla, huh? we've only a very few seconds. Get her across the no. window. Don't make me do it, Andrita. Please, oh, you don't. You wretched, sniveling coward. Do you want us both to hang? Help me get this girl to that window. You, you'll be sorry you made yeah. me, Andrita. You will, you will! <laughs> I couldn't help it, Dr. Turner. I couldn't help it. I couldn't help it. I, I just just lost my head, that's all. But she made me do it. She made me do it. Don't you see? Don't you understand how it was? She made me do it. She drove me, Dr. Turner. All right, now settle down, settle down. And do stop calling me Dr. Turner. Stop calling you doctor? You? Well, no, I'm not a psychiatrist. But I'm going to see that you meet one. Huh? I happen to be from British Intelligence, Carl. I suppose I have you to thank for that letter. What? Letter? Yes, the one supposedly signed by Sheila Campbell, telling us she was off to Dublin, Ireland. Oh, yes. It would communicate with us in five days. Well, Aunt Rita, she made me do that, too. <laughs> ah, that was an inexcusable mistake, Carl. You see, Sheila would never have written Dublin, Ireland. No, an Irishman assumes that everybody knows where Dublin is. Uh, how about that, Miss Ross? Am I right? Well, I know where it is, all right. And I'm going back there as fast as I can. Oh, <laughs> now, Julia, London isn't as bad as all that, you know. Maybe not. I suppose it all depends upon the murderers you meet. Why, child, you wouldn't want to meet a nicer lad than Carl here. After all, it isn't everybody who'd pitch his aunt through a bedroom room window just to save your life. Yes, he's really a very nice boy. Sergeant, you'd better take him down to the cellar now. And have him show you where he buried Sheila Campbell. Oh, Aunt Rita, she made me do it. Oh, no, she made you do that too. A woman of character, Miss Crabo. I'm uh, sure you'll miss her very much. But that's the way it goes. This espionage, Carl, is a very uncertain trade. And so closes The Woman in Red, starring Katina Paxinu. Tonight's tale of suspense. This is Katina Paxinu. I hope you enjoyed our suspense play this evening and that you don't hate me too much. I'm not really as bad as that. Uh, next week, I, I know you will want to listen when Mr. Orson Welles will be your star. And from April 6, 1944, Suspense on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Are you suffering with arthritis or osteoporosis? Do you have diabetes? Did you know that these are just two of the hundreds of diseases that have seen improvement with Dr. Wallach's incredible longevity products? You can't get them at a health food store. The only way to get them is to call us at 800-214-0065. That's 800-214-0065. Do you have heart disease, fibromyalgia, or high blood pressure? Do you have a terrible time losing weight? Dr. Wallach can help. He was a veterinarian and cured diseases in animals. He felt that he could do the same for humans, so he became a physician. Over 50 years of research and helping people like you goes into every bottle of Dr. Wallach's amazing discoveries. Do you want to feel better? Learn how to treat the cause of your problem rather than covering up the symptoms with drugs. Call 800-214-0065. That's 
0065. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, the conclusion of the five-part Yours Truly Johnny Dollar story, The Salt City Matter. This originally broadcast April 6th, 1956. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Johnny, this is Ellie. I've been worried to death about you. You might be even more worried when the papers come out. I'm wanted for murder. Johnny. Now listen to me. I don't have a lot of time to explain it to a policeman. I didn't kill anybody, Ellie, but I need help. Where can I meet you? If I remember right, there's a coffee shop over on... Are they looking for you all over town? Yeah, I suppose so. We better not pick any place like that. I have a blue Ford convertible, a 52. You know where Fisherman's Wharf is? Yeah. Go there. Watch for me. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Samuel Rubin and Associates, Insurance Brokers, Majestic Building, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Salt City matter. Expense account item 19, 25 cents, car fare to Fisherman's Wharf. Standing there in the light rain, it occurred to me that 48 hours had gone by since I'd last closed my eyes. I might have been reading a little when Eleanor Strauber showed up. Johnny? Johnny, Johnny. Yeah. Johnny. Same old sport. What have they done to him? Oh, easy, kid, easy. Hey, look, maybe we better get out of here. Uh, Yes. This way, all right? Fine, fine. Johnny, what can I do to help? Didn't I tell you on the phone I was wanted for murder? Yes. Aren't you going to ask me about that? You'll tell me if you want to, Johnny. Oh, I'm going to tell you, all right. And I want you to go to Inspector Dan Walsh at the Hall of Justice and tell him. Go on. Well, some of it you know, some of it you don't know. I know I'm the cause of a lot of it. If I hadn't been so dumb as to sell that big policy to Ed Julian... You had no way of knowing. My job was to protect him, get him alive, keep him alive... until the company could break their responsibility. And I've been trying to do that. But I had to find Ed Julian first. Sure. One of my best leads was an attorney named Ray Gumby. He hoped to get Julian into custody one way or another in jail. That seemed a pretty good way for me to protect him. I got a tip from a hotel clerk that Ed was in Salt City with Jim Reno and some others. Go on, Johnny. Well, I took the train over to Salt City with a subpoena to find Ed. He was there, all right. But Jim Reno found me first. He drugged my coffee, and when I went out to see Ed at the smelter works, the drug began to work. I saw Ed and Chili Winters. They were drugged, too. Reno came in a little while later and shot them with my gun. I got away from Reno. He was going to haul me down and let the Salt City Police charge me with murder. I think he owns the Salt City Police Force, too. I managed to get back here early this morning. I called the police and tried to explain all this here, but they wouldn't listen. I went over to see Ray Gumby. Ellie, Gumby was dying when I got there. He'd been shot twice. I don't know if the police know about him yet or not. Then I called you. Who shot Gumby? It was those two thugs I tangled with over at Ed Julian's apartment, Swifty and Luke. Only names I know them by. Reno killed Ed Julian and Chili Winters? Yeah. Anything else? Oh, no. One place the police won't be looking for you is my office. There's a nice couch there. You need some rest. She drove me over to her office, and ten minutes later, I was asleep. About seven o'clock, I woke up, and for the first time in days, my head was clear. Clear enough to think of a man with a pencil mark mustache who'd sold me information about Ed Julian being in Salt City. I found him in his rooms. Oh. Yeah, we got business. What are you... Uh, I, I, please, my lapel. You worry about them good and hard. I'm worried about the two men I saw murdered in cold blood in Salt City yesterday. I'm worried about the man who died in my arms early this morning. Most of all, I'm worried about myself. Please! Now, look... When you came to my hotel two days ago, you were taking a big chance about telling me where Ed Julian was. But it didn't make sense, because your kind don't take chances. What do you mean? I mean somebody paid you to look at me and tell me Julian was in Salt City. Oh, no, Mr. Dollar. Uh, uh, Oh, Ed's wife didn't know he was there. The police didn't know he was there. No one but you. Now, once again, 
Who paid you to tip me off that Ed Julian was in Salt City? Honestly, Mr. Dollar, I, I'm just a clerk there. It was just as I explained. I, I happened to be working the switchboard, and a call came in for Mr. Julian, and I just happened to overhear... You're lying. <laughs> Please. I was in Ed Julian's apartment. His calls don't come through your switchboard downstairs. He's got a private line. Please. Now, once more. Uh... Who paid you to tell me that Ed Julian was in Salt City? No one paid me. You... Who was it? <laughs> Who is it? Mr. Julian himself. What? Honestly, it was Mr. Julian. Before he left town two nights ago, he told Mr. Swift and Mr. Luke, all of us, to make it difficult for you. And then he sent me a special delivery letter with $50 in it and told me to go to you and tell you he was in Salt City. Okay. Okay, relax. What? I don't want you to make a move. I just want you to stay where you are for the next half hour. Clear? Clear. Expense account item 20, 20 cents phone call to Eleanor Strober. Johnny, are you all right? I'm getting better every minute. Did you talk to the police? Yes. They want to see you very badly. I'll go to see them as soon as I clear up some other business. Johnny, be careful. Don't worry about me. Did you tell them about Ray Gumby? Yes. They found his body... You have an awful lot of explaining to do. Now, look, I got another pickup for them. What? Not a body, just a hotel clerk. He's in his room at 412 Turk Street. I think he'll be out cold for another ten minutes. I just conked him. Well... Phone the police and tell him to send somebody out to pick him up. He's part of my story and he'll tell it. But, Johnny... And tell him to be sure and pick up Swift and Luke for Gumby's killing. Got all that? I think so. See you later. Johnny, be careful. It was dark by the time I arrived at the Skyline Apartments and took the elevator to the fourth floor. The place looked quiet and deserted. It was, for the most part, except for Lorraine Julian. She looked about the same, tired, sad. Johnny Dollar. Isn't that your name? Yeah. What are you doing here? Didn't you ever expect to see me again? No, you better go. Wait. You shouldn't be in here. Ed, walk in. Ed isn't going to walk in, Mrs. Julian. What do you mean? I dropped by to tell you you've been double-crossed. Where's Ed? Chilly Winters was gunned in Salt City. Ed Julian was shot to death, too. You're lying. I saw it happen, Mrs. Julian. Some kind of a trick. It isn't so. Not Ed. You haven't seen the papers or listened to the radio, then. They all have the story by now. It is true. Yeah, yeah, all of it. Ed told you to keep me guessing when I came around looking for him, right? Yeah, sure. Maybe you didn't know, but you were helping Jim Reno put the finger on him. I don't believe you. Ed can't be dead. Neither can Chili Winters, then, huh? It was Chili they wanted out of the way. They wanted Chili out of the way. Uh Uh-huh. Well, Chili and Ed are out of the way now, and Jim Reno's in command. What a fool. What a fool I've been. I just... I'd have done anything for him. He he asked me to get you... Get you to go over to Salt City. I loved him. I loved him. There's no way to bring him back, Lorraine. But you can help me get Jim Reno. How? How? Will you sign a statement? Anything. Get some paper. I wrote it while she sat there and helped me fill in the details. How Ed Julian and Jim Reno planned to get rid of Chili Winters. How Ed Julian took Chili over to Salt City with him. How before he left he knew that Ray Gumby had a subpoena out for him and that I, if tipped off, would eventually wind up in Salt City and be a patsy for the killing of Chili Winters. Only Jim Reno decided he'd be better off if Ed and Chili were both out of the way. Do you think this will do any good? Can we get Reno for killing Ed? In a Salt City court, no. But it stands a good chance in this town. How about Gumby? Luke. And Swift. I know. Why? Mr. Gumby knew all about the Enterprises. If there had been any kind of investigation... So they just put him out of the way, huh? Yeah. (sighs) Nice people. That's one trouble. You never usually ask about the people you fall in love with. You just go ahead and do it. (sighs) We better find a notary public. I have to turn myself into the police. A lot of things have to be explained to them. 
think you'd better get over to Salt City and explain some things there, Donna. Mr. Reno. Yeah. Hello, Lorraine. Those tricks. You killed Ed. Didn't this insurance man tell you that he shot him? Huh? Well, don't you worry. You got $50,000 coming to you now. You uh, want to thank him. $50,000 a lot of money. Why, you... Easy, sugar. I'm liable to blow your head off. You killed Ed. Well, I did it for this fella. I do, kid. Only room for one guy in our business, and that's me. And I figured you'd be here, Donna. You're a tough man. Come on. You and me, we're going back to Salt City. The police say I want to talk to you. I'm still your patsy, huh? You're still it, brother. They want you as bad as ever where I run things. <coughs> Don't! This thing might go off! <laughs> Is he dead? No, no, I still... I'll call a doctor. Once... Once you said I look like a nice girl. I... Tell me that again. Please. Tell me. Yeah. A nice girl. Expense account, item 21, $1,000, legal fees. To get a lawyer to explain formally what had happened. Item 22, $130, room and board. 23, 135, plane fare to Hartford and, uh... Johnny? Bye, Johnny. Bye, Ellie. The next time I sell an insurance policy, I'm going to ask for character recommendations. Then I won't get a nice fellow like you in... Mm. Johnny, will you be back? Well, I'll have to appear as witness against Jim Reno when his case comes up. Mm -hmm. Item 24, two bucks, two drinks. Yep, for Eleanor and me. Mm -hmm. Expense account total, $3,262. Remarks, none. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, there'll be another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, beginning next Monday night. Next week, proof that a dog's life sometimes isn't so bad. A case that starts out like a lark, just one big joke, but isn't funny for long. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Barbara Fuller, Jean Tatum, Barbara Eiler, Lawrence Dobkin, Dick Ryan, Jack Edwards, Barney Phillips, Junius Matthews, and Tony Barrett. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. And there you have it, the final part of the year's truly Johnny Dollar story, The Salt City Matter, as it was originally broadcast April 6, 1956. As I mentioned uh, earlier in the week, uh, part two of this series, is of this particular show, is missing. Uh, thanks to Ted at RadioMemories.com for finding parts one, three, four, and five. And uh, he got those to us for us to use on this program. Ted is at RadioMemories.com, and he supplies all classic radio programs on cassette on cd or on flash drive for your computer so you don't have to be internet connected to get them contact ted at radiomemories.com or call this radio station they can get you in touch with ted if you are not internet connected uh, you can also uh, contact this station and thank them for putting us on the air we appreciate them and thank the advertisers they pay the bills for this radio station to even be on the air it's greatly appreciated 
Also, uh, if you miss a day, you don't have to miss a show. You can find our shows at iHeartRadio, Spotify, Spreaker, TuneIn, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or Amazon. Just search for Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, or just go to my webpage, ClassicRadio.stream. You can stream the shows there, learn more about building a classic radio collection of your own, find our social media links, and contact me there, ClassicRadio.stream. Thanks for tuning in. Tell all your friends the great radio shows are right here at this spot on the dial. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite radio station.